everyone greetings from transnomina for all the delegates who have logged in as well as the formidable faculty uh, faculty members who have lined up for this session so just to give you an update uh, after an extremely successful first day of bic where more than 1200 fellow cardiologists virtually logged in so we are back with the first session on day 2 the topic of the session is is pretty it's, it it takes us back to our high school days it's revisiting newton's law exerting ultra high force to create lumen to take this session further we have we have with us dr nk mahesh who will be moderating the entire session sir has an experience of more than two decades in varied capacities all across uh, indian command hospitals as well as base hospital and at this point in time dr nk mahesh is the head of department and senior consultant at st gregorius medical mission hospital kerala so over to you dr mahesh thank you thank you uh, for the introductions uh, uh today's session will have uh, the following as chairpersons one is dr florin polkeli from uh, heart center lucerne in switzerland uh lucerne as i understand has got a lot of medieval architecture a fine lake snow capped mountains and it costs you 78000 rupees to get from bombay to lucerne and 20000 rupees a day to stay in the hotels there So anybody plan, planning for a trip, it's fabulous. <laughs> so the the second chairperson is Dr. M S Hiramath from Ruby Hall Clinic, Pune. I refuse to say anything further. Sir is known to all of us. Thank you, sir, for uh, gracing this occasion. Uh, the third chairperson who hasn't yet joined us but would be joining us is Dr. Pravin Chandra from Matanda, the medicine. I've uh, joined. Joined already. Yeah. Fabulous, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, he's Thank chairman you. of interventional cardiology. Uh, what what at least i personally admire the most about him is the most uh, adventurous cardiologist in india he is uh, at the front runner of all the modern all the newer technologies that come into india and uh, whenever anybody is in trouble this is the person to go to uh, dr ajit menon leelavathi hospital uh, may not be joining us but he is a consultant interventionist rakesh dr yakesh yadav is a professor of cardiology of all india institute of medicine uh, new delhi Dr. Ajay Swami, uh, Professor of Cardiology at Command Hospital, Air Force, Bangalore, uh, my colleague and uh, extremely well-read person. Uh, Dr. Keshava, Director of Interventional Cardiology, Fortis Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Prashant Panda, Assistant Professor of Cardiology, PGI, Mark Chandigarh. Dr. Srinivas uh, uh, Reddy, HOD of Cardiology, Government Medical Hospital, GMCH, 32. So uh, we would uh, have the presentations in 10 minutes. Uh, your timer would be shown on top there would be a slight rearrangement of presentations uh, so dr navin you will be presenting a little earlier than before uh, so uh, we will start with uh, dr florin kulkli the uh, the presenter from uh, from uh, switzerland he will be uh, talking on managing calcified coronary lesion with ultra high pressure dr florin the floor is yours thank you very much um it's always a great honor for me to speak to uh, to indian fellows and this has a 
a really good reason and i'm i'm praising you in the world maybe you don't know it but i i can tell you now because i always say when i so i speak a lot about high pressure balloons and about opn and ice um in different uh, countries and i always say well in india they they at least understand what i'm talking about because the doctors are very good and they understand the basic principles so it's easy for me to uh, to tell uh, to tell them about this balloon and in other countries it's very difficult because they just don't get the concept and indian doctors get it so without losing more time um let me um uh, be, begin so First, we, let's speak why PCI fails, then which balloons we should choose, and I will present you the open and see again. I'm sure you all know it and you use it in a, on a regular basis, and then I would like to demonstrate some, some cases. Um, if you look back in the history, um, we have known for a very long time now that there are some biological factors leading to a PCI failure, but most of the factors are actually uh, mechanical. And this has not changed from the time of uh, bare metal stents to drug routing stents, I think mechanics still remain a very important factor. And one of the main uh, problems we encounter in our daily life and which really prevents us from doing a better work is the presence of calcium. So I think we need to deal with calcium better. And if you use the wrong kit, then you will have dissections in the wrong parts, in the soft part of the vessel, but not tackle the calcium at all, even a thin calcium like in this case if you use the wrong balloon. And you will have pictures like that because very often we compensate our inability to tackle calcium with higher diameter. And this leads often to, di to uh, dissections and to perforations. And our patients in the future will be more and more complex. They will they have calcium, but they will be post uh, stent, post cabbage, um, elderly. So it will be more and more difficult. So we need better kits, better kit to um, tackle calcium. And depending which balloon you are using, the compliance curves will be vastly different. And this is really important to know for you as a doctor to have the proper kit in your hand and to know with which balloon you go to which pressure. Because if you go with a semi-compliant balloon to very high pressure, you, your diameter will explode and, and your vessel might explode as well. The OPNC balloon is an ultra high pressure balloon and with its unique design, it offers you um, enough force without really um, gaining a lot of diameter. If you look at the compliance curve, you will see that if you take a, a 3.0 opium balloon, it will go to 3334 3, millimeters and it will not go higher. And this is completely different with a so-called non-compliant balloon. You should know most so-called non-compliant balloons are actually just less compliant than regular compliant balloons, but it's not. they are not really non-compliant because non-compliant is, is I think the opium balloon just defines this non-compliance chart again. And very often I hear people saying, well, I use rotablation I, and then I have no problem. Well, unfortunately, like in this case, rotablation will not really guarantee stand expansion. This patient came in 2017, he was rotablated. This was the final result. But the patient came back three years later, and the reason was stent thrombosis. And I'll show you why stent thrombosis happened. Um, we, it was difficult to tackle. It was very calcified. And once we, we, we opened it, um, we did a good job. But if you focus here on panel B, you'll see the stent was not expanded. And this was the reason for stent thrombosis. And we managed to expand that. So just because you use rotablation, it does not mean that you have expanded that you have cracked the calcium, that you have expanded your lesion very well. Now, in nowadays we have different different tools to manage calcium, to understand calcium. So, in this man, 53 years old, with CT um, and angiogram, he we knew from the from the coronary CT that he has calcium. He had the calcium ring, and I'll show you um, the calcium ring here. You can see the vessel is um, a bit aneurysmatic. And then in the proximal part, after this aneurysm, um, we have really a thick calcium ring. Now, for this thick calcium ring here, you can see it here, I don't really need a lot of tools. I don't need, especially no rotablation in my center because I was able to do an OCT so I can, I can cross any balloon. In this case, I used cut and crack, something which I use a lot more recently for two reasons. One is to tackle calcium 
And in this case, I use a 3.0 cutting balloon and then a 3.5 opium balloon. I opened the vessel, then I used a 3.5 anti balloon for expansion. It was opium again, and a 4.0 semi compliant balloon for uh, opposition. And the second reason I use Captain Crack, so uh, Wolverine and open balloon, is to, uh, for leaching preparation when I implant a drug looting balloon, just to, uh, to have a better leaching preparation. Now, you can see here on this um, um, slide something very important. You can see the effect of the cutting balloon, but you can also see the effect because it's the same same um, portion of the vessel again after OPN. So the right is after OPN, um, and you can see that besides the fact that we crack the calcium, you can also compress the the part this calcium and the fibrocalcific parts. So you create lumen. So just because you crack the calcium again, this does not guarantee expansion. I believe in pressure, and I think. This is quite easily to understand as well, and you can see it here that you, you can crack the calcium and then you have to really compress this part so you create lumen for the vessel. And this was the final result. I'm sure you agree this is a good result. And this is on the longitudinal axis as well. You can see the stent is nicely expanded. So this kind of stents will not close again because they are nicely expanded. Um, I think OCT is quite important to use open and uh, more recently, I don't really treat more, any more calcified lesions without doing OCT at some stage, maybe not in the beginning, but once I can cross an OCT catheter, because I, I, I use this in order to also size my balloon. So when I see the on OCT that the vessel is 3.5, and then I usually downgrade the diameter of the balloons, so I would use a 2.5 or even 3.0 balloon, but go to very high pressure because most calcium ring you can crack uh, with a rather small uh, balloon because the calcium ring is much smaller than the vessel. Now, why does pressure matter? Even in young patients, even this is an old case, I did not use um, imaging in this case. Uh, this is a young lady with three vessel disease. The RCA is the culprit. And you can see here, I predilated with a normal uncombined balloon. It dissected the patient had pain, so I rushed and put in a stent or two stents. The problem is the proximal stent was underexpanded. And very often, and this is something I've encountered more and more in, in the years I'm, I'm working, at 25 atmospheres, the stent still does not, does not expand properly. So I had to use it at higher pressure. So in this case, at 45 atmosphere, and then at 45 atmosphere, the stent expanded. Finally, the lesion uh, gave in. Now, 74 years old a lady with a very calcified right coronary artery. You can see here this calcium chunk, and on the right side, you can see the OCT plane. Um, this is clearly calcium, it's not thrombus. Um, so in this case, I, I, I thought of using rotational thoracotomy, of using a normal anti balloon, of using even shockwave, cutting, scoring, open and see. But simple minded as I am, I said, well, let's um, do um, um, show some preparation. This was before I put the OCT catheter down. I, I checked on OCT. And then I said, well, let me crack this calcium because with a, with a, uh, with a cutting balloon, I do two things. First, I, I try to fraction the calcium a little bit. And second, I, I cut those um, collagen fibers in order to really have less retraction of the vessel. And then I use an opium balloon at 40 atmospheres. This cracked quite nicely. I put a stent in and then I use an opium balloon at 45, 40 atmospheres to just post dilate. So I used open for pre and post dilatation. And you can see this was the result. Then I did OCT again. And when you do OCT and you try to achieve a perfect result, then you become really a perfectionist. So I was not happy with the um, stent expansion because although the balloon was opening, the vessel was collapsing again because it just had too much retraction force. So I put a stent, uh, I put a second stent, and then this was the final result of the second stent. And I'm sure you agree this is a nicely expanded stent, and uh, the patient is doing fine. Now, sometimes we just have to keep PCI simple in patients who are frail, elderly, and we don't want to play around a lot. This was an old case in uh, 2013. Ejection fraction of 20%, old lady, bad LV function, so all the bad things. Uh, you can see here, our right is occluded, circumflex is actually occluded as well, and the idea was to fix the LED in this frail lady. Now, 
this was in the early days, in the early days of um, I, I was using open balloon. So I, I used here two balloons at uh, 20, uh, 2020 and 2520. And you can see I used first a normal non-compliant balloon just to create some space. And this is something I do frequently. So I don't I don't um, get frustrated when the open balloon does not cross immediately. I say, okay, fine, I'll use a normal empty balloon, just a small one, two zero, to create some space, and then I'll go on and, and um, use proper kit. So in this case, the lesion was nicely expanded. I put two stents in, um, and the result was was good. After four years, this lady came back and she had pain, uh, chest pain again. And we all thought she has a restenosis in the in the LED. And you can see here, even after so in the in such a calcified lesion, the result after four years looks quite nice. She has really great long-term angiographic result. I even considered opening the right at this stage, but but she was so frail and so old. So I said, okay, fine, leave it. I'm sure she's dead now in the meantime, because this is now um five, six years ago. But I think it's important to understand that if you do a good job, if you gain enough lumen, then the result in the long term will be good. Now, can we combine rotablation or other techniques with, with uh, high pressure? I think high pressure should always be in the center of, a, of treatment when you treat a patient with a calcified lesion or with heavily, heavily calcified lesion. And then this can be um, this can be rotablation in order to, to just um, uh, be able to cross a kit down there. This can be shockwave if you want to combine it, because sometimes I believe this is actually not a bad concept, combining shockwave and open balloon for lesion preparation before you implant a stent. I think we should not be um, fundamentalist and say, well, I use only one or I use second, but I think we, the time has come to combine all these different kits. So in this case, I use, this is also a very old case, um, OPN for pre and post citation. This was the final result in this heavily calcified lesion. And what, it, what I love a lot and why I show this case, 18 months later, you can see the result is fantastic. Um, the, he has had no restenosis, and this is the important. Now, just briefly, our study, which we performed and which we published, um, I think, two years ago, um, we demonstrated that in order to achieve a perfect stent expansion, you need um, non-compliant balloon for pre and post dilatation, and in this study, most of them were open balloon. So just by using a semi-compliant balloon for pre dilatation or a normal non-compliant balloon, and then post dilating hard, this will not give you the perfect exp ex expansion. The perfect expansion or the best expansion is reached when you use for pre and post dilatation a non-compliant balloon. And this is a concept um, which is which we have used in our center for many years and which is very successful. Now, just maybe some concerns because I hear this all the time. Um, I don't use OPN because it's bulky. It's true it's bulky, but use a proper guide, use a proper uh, proper wire. Because if you do a calcified vessel, then you should be prepared. This is like going to war. And if you go to war, you don't go with a rifle. And you think, do you have some air, uh, some, some air support, some really big cannons in order to, to fight this war? Um, then I hear people, I prefer debulking and cracking the calcium with rotablation. Well, it's true, you can do that, but the problem is most of us don't do imaging and then guide rotablation according to that, because then would you would use two, three burrs for one case. And in most cases, people use just one burr. So with one, one to five burr, you don't debulk the lesion. Um, I'm afraid of high pressure inflations. Well, I'm afraid of high <laughs> diameter because the diameter ruptures the vessel and not, not the, the pressure. And then I have people who say, well, you must perforate all the time. Well, no, if you respect the diameter of the vessel, and if you do the, the concept, downsize the balloon diameter and upsize the pressure, then you will have no perforations. Um, so I think it's important to use a proper wire, use a proper, uh, proper um, balloon, use guide extension if you cannot deliver it down, and avoid oversize. So let me just uh, bring my take home messages. PCI failure is very often mechanical, and we have to address these mechanical factors. And I love this session that it will deal just with mechanics of calcified lesions, because this is very important. Now, good lesion preparation will always help you achieve good stent expansion. And this is what we want for our patients. We should not leave stents under expanded. And I think it's also very important in calcified lesions, very often we need more pressure, not more diameter. This is especially young, uh, important for young fellows. And I think in my opinion, the open balloon is the only balloon 
which allows dietitian at ultra high pressure without reaching a very, very big diameter, which will burst your vessel. Thank you very much. I have 10 seconds left, but let me finish. Thanks a lot. Fabulous, Dr. Farim. Hey, but sir, your comments, and then we will go on to Dr. Barua, where we are uh, slightly short of time. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Florin, a uh, very good justification where we should use the uh, opium balloon and uh, uh, how we should be uh, judging the pressure. But let me ask you one question. Suppose you have a calcified lesion, which is very focal, and uh, you have the vessel, which is say three plus, 3.1, 3.2. So in that case, uh, uh, when you take a uh, NC, open NC, the diameter should be three or two five. Two five. I I really this is very important, very good question. I think because if you look on OCT, the diameter of the ring is not the diameter of the vessel. The ring is much smaller than the, the vessel. So if the if the vessel is three five. And your ring is three zero, then don't go with a three zero. You can crack it with two five because the ring has certain thickness. So if you apply enough pressure, um, I have actually this case. I did not have it now in the presentation, um, but but I I think it's very important to really not um, not overdo it with with the diameter. Um, I sent it actually to Nancy to uh, to share it with uh, with the viewers uh, with, with this. Um, um, be, uh, one case where I I implanted a three five stand, but I cracked the ring with two five balloon at forty atmospheres. Very good comment. I think due paucity of time, we'll go on, Doctor Florim. Thank you very much for that. Thanks a lot of yours, uh, Doctor Barua. Are you ready? You are up next because Doctor Ankush is uh, not joined in so far. Dr. Barua is an interventional cardiologist and head of cardiology of the Apollo Hospital in Vishakhapatnam. Uh, old friend of mine, great operator. Dr. Barua, the field is yours. You're muted. You can share your screen. Is it visible? Yeah, it is. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh, for your uh, kind words. Uh, good evening to uh, all. Uh, this is, uh, I just want to show one case uh, which I feel uh, this uh, particular balloon has uh, you know, really helped me in uh, tackling this particular case. Uh, this is the case history. This is an uh, octogenarian, 80 year old hypertensive man presented with a chest pain with sweating and mild dyspnea at rest. Uh, hemodynamically, he was stable. And uh, ECG shows you can see that all inferior M or anterior MI with mild maybe ST coving in the anterior leads. And uh, LBEF was low, 32% as you can make out from the ECG. And uh, the original almost in, uh, in the LED territory. He has a little anemia. Serum creatinine was high, 1.8, expected at this age. And troponin was high. And of course, it is done in COVID time. So we need to do the COVID. And our ACRCT was uh, not suggestive of any COVID. This is interesting. Past history, he has a primary PCI with stenting in LED 2008. And 2013, he came with, again, ISR and with the distal edge of the stent, uh, which was treated with uh, uh, this another DES at the uh, overlay se segment, that uh, no distal segment, a DES was put. But uh, the DES probably could not be, you uh, know, uh, the crack in that uh, calcified and you know, overlaid segment. So it was left uh, with a residual of 30 to 40%. And 2018, again, he came with ACS with re of the stand at the overlaid zone. And uh, it was treated with a high pressure balloon dilatation and still left out with some residual stenosis. This time, uh, this is the presentation 2021, just three months back he presented. You can see this is the 2018 uh, angiogram. Uh, you can see that this is the overlapping zone where stent was not uh, fully open. And uh, it was tried with a, a, a non-compliant balloon with a very high pressure, but uh, could not be uh, cracked here. And, uh, that time, this is the angio, uh, this, this is the angioplasty 
This is done with a 2.5 uh, non-compliant balloon at 25 atmosphere, but uh, could not be uh, cracked here. You can see here the waste was left out. And in fact, uh, subsequently when short balloon was tried uh, at that point to go to high pressure, but the balloon got ruptured. Luckily, uh, didn't have major complications, like mild slow flow. And uh, finally, it was left because uh, you now, uh, Screen is not Again, there is a, this is a non-compliant balloon with a you know, body wire it was tried, uh, but it could not be cracked. And finally, it was left like that because the uh, flow was uh, you know, good and uh, there is some mild residual seams, residual seams was left out in the standard segment. You can see here, this is the angiographic final result in 2018. And uh, apart from that area, his distal LED was fairly okay. Right coronary was fine and left uh, circumflex was okay. And uh, this time, 2021, he has come with uh, this angiogram. You can see that uh, you know, this, uh, this is uh, actually uh, this uh, late stent thrombosis. You can see the stent was uh, you know, thrombosed at that point again, there's no distal flow. And uh, so we plan to do angioplasty again this time uh, because uh, he had uh, you know, continued to have angina. This is the uh, uh, balloon, small balloon. We open, then uh, we open with a 2.5 non-compliant balloon. But you can see here, this is uh, a you know, water balloon seeding effect. Uh, it was very interesting. It was the balloon was not able to hold there. It just keep on you know, jumping and you know, approximately and distally. Keep on coming out once you try to go to high pressure and jumping. I think this is also interesting. Uh, just I went uh, through the watermelon effect, you know, but this is important in ISR. This has some implications in the long term and immediate result. As you see here, this was associated with diffuse ISR and a poor TME flu distal flow, more balloon dilatation, longer balloon time, and poor acute result if you have uh, this phenomenon. Even at the long term, the higher risk stenosis rate. And uh, a logistic regression analysis in this particular reef studies shows that watermelon seeding effect was emerged as a predictor of the recurrence restenosis in ISR. So uh, this is the uh, result we have with the balloon dilation. There is no good flow. And uh, so we thought uh, because it's a thrombotic lesion, we try to pass on the thromboaspiration export catheter which could not be completely caused, though it went to the, uh, no, uh, that particular point, and we did aspiration. It has gave some uh, little bit of better results. You can see that flow has been established with thrombus. You can very well appreciate in this point, and, uh, but flow is a little better, though distal flow is not good. Uh, probably thrombus might have migrated or maybe some kind of, uh, kind of uh, this uh, coronary spasm. And, uh, Subsequently, we have taken an open NC balloon. You can see that problem was here, the 2.5 open NC balloon was taken. Uh, you can see that it's similar to the previous you know, uh, kind of non-compliant non balloon, waste is remaining. Now, problem was that when you uh, go to high pressure, this patient had a severe angina because that was the uh, little you know, apprehension with, uh, with this particular patient uh, because you know, he continues to have severe angina when you go, to, go up to high pressure. Every time you go up to high pressure, maybe 25 or no, 27, he is severe and again we have to deflate it. So uh, we need to do repeatedly that same kind of same thing because of the angina. Uh, I was a little apprehensive. You know, you can see that again. I use the balloon, little proximally try again, and uh, this is again balloon wasters there. So because multiple times we had to dilate only because of the angina. So we had to give some time to the patient and maybe for the artery to accommodate the balloon. Suddenly, if you go with a very high pressure, suddenly this kind of situation, we do not know oh, what will be a consequence. I didn't want to have a, any kind of leak in this uh, very old sick patient. So <clears throat> finally, I had to put on body wire. This is also one idea to, a good idea to put a body wire. Sometimes, you know, if you go to very high pressure, that wire, a balloon might get stuck to the, uh, the wire. So you can take out the balloon and the wire uh, together and leaving the another wire to do the subsequent work. So this is a bit, uh, not a bad idea, but there is also body wire uh, to work as a you know, kind of uh, help to this, uh, dilate the lesion. Finally, you can see maybe around uh, 35 to 40, somewhere around 37, 38, probably the balloon got uh, you know, uh, this lesion yielded. So there's a great relief here. 
<clears throat> but still, the patient continued to angina because of that beyond uh, I didn't go beyond for beyond you know, 37 or so, uh, but lesion yielded. Still, maybe very mild uh, residual was left out. Uh, but I thought uh, this will be enough for him to have you know, uh, no, uh, this uh, with uh, this uh, reduced angina and this problem. You can see here now after giving all this uh, nitro and nicorandil and all, flow is a little better. Although this is, looks very mucky and the distal lesion was not fully really open, I have feeling this is a, and this a partly thrombus and a partly this a, a, a coronary vasospasm. Uh, subsequently, <clears throat> this is the final result we have. And uh, we thought uh, uh, because this is a recurrent restenosis and uh, this is the only culprit area, these other areas are relatively stable, what we have seen in 2018. I thought you know, just uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, deposit some drug here by using a drug eluting balloon. A magic test balloon was used here. And uh, this was the drug eluting balloon dilatation. And subsequently, we have a, a fairly uh, good result in this area. Although, though there is uh, no uh, no distal part of the artery is not properly seen, uh, because it was not, we we're not sure about it, we thought it's a thrombus. So we left at this point. You know, uh, uh, planning that we need to have a recheck angiogram uh, sometime later because we, I tried to reduce the contrast because he had a CKD and I didn't give that much of contrast, so we stop at this point of time. And I just went to the treatment of ISR in this kind of situation. As you know, DEB and new generation DES have the similar clinical efficacy for treatment of B, uh, BMS ISR that all of us know that. However, DS shows more MLD and a decreased risk of TLR for treatment of DES ISR. So DS is supposed to be better with uh, treatment of DES ISR. And there's a recent meta-analysis coming in Jack 2020. It shows that the DCB uh, is uh, associated with a significantly higher TLR rates compared with the repeat DS implantation in treatment of DES ISR. However, same uh, I have same uh, meta-analysis shows that DCB shows the lower death MI and lesion thrombosis. Although TLR is, TLR is uh, high with the DCB, but it shows the lower death, MI, and lesion thrombosis. So uh, having shown this slide, I think uh, still we are a little confused about the treatment of uh, ISR in our clinical practice. I think uh, with that, uh, we thought, I thought, you know, better not to put a uh, kind of uh, another stand in this. Uh, I thought we'll wait for some time because he's a very old person. And he uh, got relief with angina. You can see after 48 hours, we did angiogram. There are some you know, kind of narrowing here. Still, I feel there is some kind of uh, thrombus or still uh, spasm. So I thought we leave the patient at this point and uh, follow him up closely uh, without putting a stent here because flu I feel flu is good in this particular angiogram. And uh, after three months follow up, he is comfortable, he's happy, no angina. Uh, LVF uh, improved to 40%. Renal function remaining almost same, 1.6, it was 1.8. And uh, we are planning to follow up very closely with continuous uh, DAPT, maybe in future required, uh, depending on the situation we have to tackle. If there is lesion, we have to put a long DS, which I didn't want at this point of time. In conclusion, a treatment of ISR with non dilatable lesion is the rotational atherectomy and, and if requires CAVG. And uh, rotational atherectomy in this particular setting, acute MI setting with high uh, thrombus burden is a relative contraindication, I should say is unconventional. And because of the risk of platelet activation by the rotablator, as well as high chances of no reflow. CABG, of course, is another uh, kind of option we have, but uh, this particular situation, it is considered, uh, considered as a high risk in this particular patient because of the acute MI, is CKD, and of course, the LV dysfunction. And, OPNNC balloon found to be effective in this uh, chronic case with very tough ISR in an octogenary in recurrent restenosis and acute coronary syndrome. I think OPN balloon saved the day for me in this particular case. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Barua. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Praveen Chandra to comment on the case and also to answer the question that's asked by Dr. Ramai as to on the use of uh, OPN balloon in acute MI. Okay. So I actually uh, am very glad to see such nice cases. And Dr. Barua's case was really very nice to demonstrate how you can effectively use open NC balloon in this situation in a totally undilatable lesion. 
So Dr. Ramaya asked about the use of OpenNC in acute MI. You can certainly use it. It's like any other balloon. And if the lesion is not yielding, then I think we should use an OpenNC balloon. There is no uh, question about it because you will not be able to use a rotablator because rotablator is not a good idea in an undilatable lesion in acute MI. Then using a shock wave will be too much. And in that situation, I think this is a good option unless until you have laser. So we have done laser sometimes in this situation, but open NC is a very handy pick device. And let me tell you, I use it very frequently and uh, it is really very safe to use it. Going up to even 40, 45, 50 atmospheres, not a problem. And the sizing as Dr. Uh, Hiremath was discussing about the sizing part, uh, we do it one is to one. Generally, it works out reasonably well. And uh, according to the, you know, the visual estimates. So if you go by a IVAS estimate, then it's a different thing because IVAS generally is 0.5 or 0.25 higher than the visual estimate. So we will go by the visual estimate and use uh, to, to such high pressures without any problems. And uh, crossing these lesions is sometimes an issue, but if you pre-dilate with a 1.5 or a two millimeter balloon in this kind of situation, it works out quite well. So overall, I think it's a very good device very effective for situations like what Dr. Barua showed and what Dr. Uh, uh, Florim showed, uh, very in, you know, fantastic cases, very heavy calcifications. And let me tell you one thing, I have almost like 50% times when I use shockwave, I have to use open NC. This is something which I must tell you. So I was thinking sometimes whether we should still use uh, shockwave that much or not or just to go straight ahead and try going with the open NC and then uh, finish off with that. Why use such an expensive device? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we will go on to the next presentation and uh, that's my presentation. And after that, uh, we will uh, have discussion on the topics again. So mine is a very simple, straightforward case. Uh, this is uh, an OCT guided PCO of a calcified vessel using high pressure balloon. Greetings from my new institute, that's Paramela Heart Institute. So 56 male, chronic smoker, breast angina, 2D echo showed here for 50%, 80% stenosis in the proximal middle lady with heavy calcium load, circumflex distal cutoff, RCA proximal distal diffuse disease with maximum 95% stenosis. RCA lesion was addressed with two tests and then elective and lady angioplasty was planned. Right radial artery was cannulated with a six front sheet, six front EBU was the guide. LED was wired with a sand blue wire. OCT round was taken to assess the LED lesion. And OCD, this is the uh, first oh. shot and this is the second shot. And this is the first OCT round. OCT round shows, uh, this was done with saline. So a little bit of specs of the distal part can be seen approximately it'll clear out as we come back. Uh, total length of about uh, 31.7 millimeters. There is a calcium length, which can be seen in this area, this is heavily calcified area. You can see superficial and deep calcium, and then it opens out to a large vessel. So if you analyze this uh, lesion, you will find that the distal landing zone is quite good. There is a 4.72 uh, millimeter squared area, 11 o'clock to five o'clock calcium. And little ahead, there is a, a second calcium block from 10 o'clock to two o'clock with the calcium thickness of 1, point, uh, 1 millimeter, this thing. And uh, here there's a 4.52 millimeter uh, uh, calcium distribution uh, across a vessel, which is about four millimeters, and minimum luminal area was 1.53, and the landing proximal landing zone was 9.12 millimeters squared luminal area. So initially, it was dilated with a, a two millimeter balloon. There was a significant uh, waste seen, and we switched over to the OPN high pressure balloon. First OPN NCT balloon we used was a two into 15 millimeter, which was used at three uh, 30 atmospheres. We did get good results, but it did not open out to the level that we were thought that it would. So this we upgraded to a 3 into 15 millimeter uh, OPM balloon. And this we went at 40 atmospheres. This time we can see that that, that area is visibly uh, visibly cracked up and you can see the uh, lesion has been opened out even on angiogram. And subsequent to that, we did, this is how an OCT run looks like when you do an OCT run uh, without doing a contrast. You can see the OCT uh, wire going back. It's slightly deeply engaged so that I, I get to isolate the lady and there is no uh, saline going into the circumflex. 
then uh, this is the uh, this is the post was uh, after high pressure post dilatation you can see that there is significant damage to the non calcified area and the calcium has been damaged to some extent there is there are areas of calcium still persisting but majority of the area has been significantly broken down and uh, the uh, proof of the pudding is of course in the expansion that we got and in the subsequent stent when we deployed so this is the uh, this is the stent that was deployed it was a 3 into 33 millimeter uh, drug eluting stent which was deployed into the this is the post initial deployment you can see that the uh, the the expansion is adequate but there are areas in the distal landing zone is good minimal luminal area there is still an area of some speck that it can be seen uh, there is some uh, residual dissection flap that can be seen the proximal landing zone is also looking good so this was further post dilated with a uh, 3 into 8 uh, OPM NC at very uh, at again uh, 25 atmosphere pressures till we got an opening that was adequate. This was the final uh, OCT run that we had taken, and this is the final angio shot we had taken. The final OCT run did show that there is a significant, uh, uh, very nicely opened out uh, vessel. You can see the proximal stent is going to come into view now. The position is good, not the best of the OCT pictures, I agree. Uh, the this is a, a clinically useful OCT run where you can identify that the stent has been uh, deployed adequately. This is the maximum we could get despite going up to three in, in the three uh, uh, millimeter balloon at uh, 30 atmospheres post dilatation. Subsequent follow up does show that the patient is doing well. Uh, they, we have not studied him angiographically, but uh, clinical follow-up has shown very good uh, clinical follow-up. So this is the final uh, MLA comparison pre and post. If you see, we have got from 2.92 to 3.25. MLA has gone from 1.53 to 5.97, and the diameter has gone up from 3 to 3.56. A little bit of red spots can be seen. This is basically because of some flaps which are in seen inside the vessel. Otherwise, uh, the flow was good and uh, follow up has been good thank you open for discussion dr himan sir your opinion and then we can go on to dr Srinivasan. yeah nice case dr mahesh i think it shows all the steps that one should do when you're finding a very very hard lesion which is difficult to expand with a regular non-compliant. Uh, I, I think all the steps are good and we already discussed that when you're going to take the uh, inflation pressures to something like uh, 50, 50 uh, the uh, diameter should be half size less. I think that's a, a technique which uh, I follow almost every time and then you're very comfortable going to a pressure of 50. Thank you, sir. Dr. Uh, Srinivas. Just one, one point for discussion, uh, Dr. Mahesh. Would you yeah. size the balloon differently whether you're preparing the lesion or you're post-dilating with the stent? Uh, if I have to uh, prepare the lesion, I did prepare I the lesion with a small balloon. Yes. Right. Then right. when I found that that, that, uh, that did not give me an adequate movement or adequate space for the stent to go through or the calcium has not been tackled, because I did the uh, OCT run after the initial preparation, which was not adequate. Then I went up with the three balloon, which was uh, exactly the size of the inner lumen. And then only we went ahead and got the lumen that is satisfactory. Sizes were definitely different. No, no, no. I'm, 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 the strategy is perfect. And it's just what we do. Since uh, this question arises or a comment arises from the previous discussion that we had, wherein we size the balloon according what size do you take if you have a lot of thick calcium, whether you take the same size or you know you take a different size or you take a bigger size you know if the vessel is 3 it's been uh, commented that we should take a 2.5 and go to if one has to go to really high pressures sometimes when even after cut one cuts and does an nc balloon almost one is to one you find that the stent hasn't expanded to where you would want it to especially when we do the oct so our practice in the lab is the size we choose based on whether we are pre dilating or preparing or whether we are post dilating a stent when we're post dilating a stent after obvious the stent is always delivered after we have adequately prepared but sometimes even after preparing with the 0.5 millimeter balloon which is smaller than the size 
the OCT then shows us that the segment where the maximum calcium is hasn't expanded. In that situation, what we do in our lab, I don't know what the others would do, and I'd be very interested to know is we take a 1S to 1 OP and NC for post dilating distance and then use that up to 35 atmospheres. Beyond that, you would be scared to go when you're post dilating because of fears of polymer disruption, fracture, etc. So just a comment for the others to, to share. I think that is the consensus from whatever I could hear from Dr. Hiramit and Dr. Praveen Chandra that 1S to 1 when you're post dilating or pre dilatation should be 0.5 yes. Dr. Srinivas Reddy, you got anything to add to this? Recently demonstrated the imaging in a cultural Konawe uh, cell, and that uh, doing a pre uh, procedural imaging is quite important because you have demonstrated that you have there is a calcification, there is eccentric calcium, thick calcium, and that was broken with a balloon, or, or demonstrated there are fractures and cuts in there. And this is the most important part pre procedural imaging in a calcific lesion because you have to choose the therapy of which therapy is uh, to be uh, defined prior to doing the calcium modification in this calcific lesion. I think you excellently demonstrated after 10 because so, so my concept is uh, the understanding is that I think it's important that post uh, send after deployment when you have done a OCT it should be matching e, 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 EL to EL and it's not uh, your, you, you, you just how to but just match that to do more than DL to EL based on OCK will create a problem. If it's less than that, you'll create more expansion. I think you have clearly demonstrated the concept, uh, the importance of imaging in uh, culture. Excellent demonstration. Dr. Florim, I forgot you're there. Uh, we need your comments on the sizing of the balloons pre and post. Well, um, I actually, let me start this. I actually agree with, um, with the comments. I think um, in pre dilatation, I'm quite conservative um, by using this 0 0.5 less. However, in post dilatation, especially if you use imaging, you can you can guide it. I mean, if you implant a 3.5 stent and your diameter is only 2.5 uh, post stenting, then you would not use a 3.5. Then use a 3.0 to reach, you know, 3.2, 3.3, and then you might be happy already. But if your diameter is 3.5 of the stent and you have reached 3.2 and it still looks underexpanded, then use a 3.5 balloon to achieve it. So I think it's important to, to, uh, to play it. You cannot say, because very often the size of the stent you implant is not the size of the vessel you, you, you mean you had. Or, you, you know, without imaging, it's, it's quite hard. And then I would, I'm rather conservative. But with imaging, I, in positation, I can be very, um, you know, one-to-one -one is fine. But I use a lot of imaging. Um, Dr. Florin, uh, suppose you use a half millimeter uh, less sized balloon for pre dilatation. Mm -hmm. You need to use uh, another uh, NC uh, OPN NC balloon for post dilatation, or that time you can take a, just a conventional non compliant balloon? Well, I think if you have cracked the lesion already quite nicely, then very often a normal non-compliant balloon will be enough to expand your stent. But if it's a heavily calcified lesion, really heavily calcified lesion, and you have not cracked it perfectly, and sometimes you just don't know because you will inflate and then you will have a dissection and you want to put a stent because the patient has pain. Then I just, uh, I use an opium um, again. But if I use, let's say if I, from 100 opium balloons, I use, you know, maybe I would say, about uh, 50 I use for pre um, 25 I use for pre and post and 25 I use just for post um, where I'm just surprised by, by how, how um, hard the lesion is. And, and I did not use it upfront. I did not use imaging, for example, but most balloons I use for pre only, I would say, because I think that's the, that's the moment you really do it because the problem is if you do not predilate with an opium balloon um, in a heavily calc calcified lesion, just with post dilatation you might not do the job because you cannot apply the force to the to the calcium, but you apply it into the stent, and this is this might hinder you to really exert the maximum force you want. So the pre dilatation is more important than the post dilatation pressures. Extremely important. I think pre-dilatation is, is really the, the moment we, we show 
uh, love for our patient. Post-lactation is just fixing, fixing in a way your uh, your your job which you did not do uh, ten minutes ago. Thank you. Uh, we will have further discussions as we go down this uh, fabulous discussion so far. So next, we are, I request Dr. Tejas P. Patel from Sims Hospital, Ahmedabad. Again, a very famous personality. Uh, he shall be presenting a topic of expanded the unexpanded, optimizing post and expansion PCI in ACS situation. A question that was just just asked on this. Dr. Patel, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, respected <coughs> chairperson and the moderator. Uh, uh, my topic is uh, my case is again very simple case, uh, but sometimes in the ACS situation. Uh, as we discussed right, uh, since 4 p.m., that uh, the pre dilatation is very, very important. But many a time it can be missed, uh, especially in the SA situation because in the hurry and all. And uh, we have encountered a similar case a few months ago. Uh, it was 82 years old gentleman, had no other comorbidities, uh, presented with acute uh, enteral myocardial infarction for four hours of the window period. He was actually father of a doctor, an MBBS doctor. And he was given loading prior to coming to our hospital uh, with the Bilinta. ECO was showing LV ejection fraction was 45% with RWMA of the LED territory. And this was the angiography. Uh, RCA was mildly disease uh, and it was uh, not significant. Uh, this is a, a, a left system where you can see that the osteal circumflex is diseased, uh, which can be 40-50% uh, uh, in severity. But the LED in the uh, early distal segment was showing tight lesion. Uh, though the flow distally was TV2, but it was a culprit uh, a lesion uh, which was create, which has created the interval MI. And even in the angiography, uh, uh, proximal LED was showing some diffuse uh, intermediate lesion. And severe calcification uh, was visible uh, even at the some place. It was tram trick kind of calcification was visible uh, even though in the angiography itself. Uh, the pre dilatation was done uh, routinely with 2 into 12 millimeter of NC balloon uh, at 16 atmosphere uh, of the uh, lesion. And uh, it was yielded very well at that point. Uh, the first stent was put as there was a, a huge a size discrepancy. Distally, it was very small uh, artery, small LED. So 2, two into 30 millimeter of drug eluting stent was put on the distal segment and it was expanded very well uh, in the angiography. Uh, another stent was put with the overlapping uh, in the proximal part uh, uh, where there was an intermediate lesion and uh, uh, it was 3 to 22 millimeter of drug eluting stent with the overlapping uh, uh, to the distal stent uh, it was uh, put and then we can see it here after putting the second stent, uh, second stent there was some part of the uh, mid segment of the LED which was looking under expanded. It was tried to do the dilatation with uh, post dilatation with the NC balloon, uh, 3 into 12 millimeter at high pressure up to 20 to 24 millimeter uh, of the uh, atmosphere of the pressure, but it was not yielding well. And you can see it here, though, the, that portion of the, uh, the actual lesion was distally, uh, distal, but the proximal part where we put the second stent, uh, that part, uh, some part of that thing, uh, that stent is under expanded. And then we have used the opinion NC. Uh, 3 into 10 millimeter and gradually inferred up to 30 atmosphere. And uh, you can see it here that the, that part of the uh, stand, which was not expanded, now getting expanded fully and the balloon yielded very well after that. And uh, this was the final angio uh, with the good distal flow and uh, some part of some, there was some recoiling in the, uh, at the part where it was elevated, but the all over result was uh, good, acceptable. Uh, we all know that calcium modification therapies, balloon-based atherectomy or IVL, and especially in the balloon-based, we have cutting balloon, scoring balloon, routine NC balloon, and now we have OPN NC balloon. Uh, if we compare head-to-head, -head, uh, the limitations of the conventional treatment is that with the NC balloon, arterial stretch, tone bogging, especially with the semi-compliant, the compliant balloon, which is very common. Scoring and the cutting balloon, uh, usually the pressure range is small. Usually they are used for the uh, pre preparation uh, of the lesion prior to the stent. Uh, high chances of the dissection, perforation is again very common with the scoring and the cutting balloons. Vessel interrupt is again a non complication uh, or catastrophe uh, of this kind of balloon and uh, it cannot be used in the complex lesion. 
and rotational atherectomy as we all know that in the eccentric lesion uh, it has not been proven uh, very well uh, requires high learning curve as well and uh, do not read the medial calcium uh, which is very very important sometimes in some uh, patients uh, so open nc we all know that it's a spatial balloon with the unique technology uh, it's a dual uh, folding in the small vessel diameter and dual balloon system basically and uh, uh, that's why it is giving the even pressure uh, uh, distribution and without any dog bogging. So you can see it here that line, linear uh, compliance and the control growth of this kind of balloon, even at the high pressure, uh, it, is, uh, it is uniform. And uh, that's the reason it is not creating any dog bogging and giving the equal high pressure to the area without any much expansion and without any dog bogging. Uh, lastly, the tips and tricks, I think it has been discussed uh, since last uh, one hour, that we should avoid polymer sleeve wires, uh, especially the hydrophilic wires like filter XT and Visco when we use this kind of balloon, uh, especially when we go for the high pressure. Uh, for assessing distal lesions, use extra support guide wires like Grand Slam, All Star or Sion Blue extra support. Uh, for pre-dilatation, again, it's a, a, a discussion of uh, uh, discussion by all uh, uh, that uh, what is the size of the pre and the post dilatation? But what usually we follow is that pre dilatation is with 0.5 millimeter lesser, and post dilatation is one uh, post dilatation. Uh, uh, and for the instant resonosis, one rest to one size of opian NC uh, has to be used. Uh, uh, it should be used with the opian ID that is a special uh, inflation device, which can go up to 55 bar for the inflation of for the high pressure inflation, and. Uh, in pressure should be uh, increased gradually after when we reach to the 20 atmosphere so that it can go gradually over the uh, few seconds uh, we should increase the pressure to reach to 35 or 40 or even higher uh, pressure thank you very much and uh, i would like to have questions i think dr keshava ramaya your comments and then i have a question for the expert panel uh, I, I think uh, it's uh, greatly he has demonstrated. However, uh, uh, imaging was necessary, I think, because of whatever constraint they have not done the imaging. But I think a very good case to demonstrate uh, OPNNC. I had only one query that uh, in a uh, uh, acute MI situation, if you do a high pressure dilatation, distal embolism is going to be very very big issue not pertaining to this case but anyhow i think uh, suppose you use a 3mm balloon stent looks under because in acute mi sizing is going to be slightly more difficult because of vasospasm and all suppose you use a opn nc in this type of situation there may be more distal embolism like this or should you wait a couple of days and then bring back the patient and then use the open nc was my uh, my thoughts at the previous case, which was a acute uh, AC, ACS situation like scenario. Hirmat, sir, your comments. Uh, I would feel uh, the uh, possibility of distal embolization when you go. I mean, normally I would deploy all stents at about 30 atmosphere pressure with an NC. So when we are going from 30 to 40, 45, and maybe 50, uh, we are not actually, we are exerting a pressure, but not expanding continuously. If you see the diameter, final diameter achieved with an OPN NC, it's pretty close uh, at 30 as well as 50 atmospheric pressure. So I would probably not uh, bring the patient back again, you know, and uh, do a complete job in the first setting itself uh, during an acute MI. Can I add a comment here? Yeah, please. Um, I, I, so I have a lot of experience doing exactly that. And um, I have maybe a series of about 200 patients where we have done exactly that. So not, so basically in most of the STEMI cases, we are performing by just doing a direct stenting. And then we establish flow. We give the patients heparin we wait three to four days. And then before they, they go home, we do OCT. As we bring them back, do OCT and then post dilate. And one thing I have encountered is that we have probably done a lot of damage in the acute setting. Because by 
by um, expanding, you know, a three, five, four O balloon, any any balloon you use, you very you will have disembolization in at least one third of these patients. And if you have that disembolization, you will cause a lot of damage. And sometimes we just have not realized how much damage we might create to the patient. And the risk of a re-angio for the patient is nowadays from the radial approach really minimal. So I we will actually publish now a, a paper exactly on this. And, and I know it's for the patient, it's one more intervention, but I think if it's, if it's an important vessel like proximal LED or big right, I would advocate to not insist with, with uh, finishing the job right away. So uh, here uh, I have a, a slightly different, different opinion. And of course we have to prove that this is a good concept, but in our center is now, uh, so my consultants, they are afraid <laughs> to postulate acutely because they, they, they have seen how, how good it can go without doing that. Thank you. Paucity of time and paucity of money. Both of them have our restrictions now. Uh, yeah. I go on to the next speaker, please, Dr. Naveen Matthew, who is a uh, professor of cardiology at the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. He will be presenting a case on rotate and shock. Naveen, yours. We can't hear you, Naveen. Am I audible now? Yeah, now you're audible. Please go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mahesh. We, we have a lot of time, but the finances are really restricted is what my case will be demonstrating. This is a story of an 81-year-old man with a long history of a documentary coronary artery disease right from 1985 when he had an infralateral MI, which was thrombolized, and reinfarction in the same territory in 2003, which was also thrombolized. Then three years down the line, he presented to us with class 2 angina which has got a three-vessel disease and occluded uh, RCA, which was left for medical follow-up, which was collateralizing from the left system. Uh, but the left system, uh, proximal LED was tendered with a tax stent and the uh, circumflex received another tax stent. That was in 2006. He was going on smoothly with that uh, for uh, many years. This is what he left behind. Left in 2006. Here he has got a stent in the circumflex and here he has got a stent in the LED. But both the proximal and distal end of the standard segments seems to have flux. So this was in 2006. Uh, he was remaining symptomatic, comfortable with an uploaded RCA collateralizing from this system and uh, moving around. And in 2013, he presented again with uh, effort angina class 2. This time we did an angiogram. Both stents were patent, uh, but uh, it's the same RCA is collateralized. And uh, this is what uh, uh, it was in. Uh, this is what uh, it was in. Uh, 2013. So we gave, gave him a good a good distal LED, very well graftable vessels. Uh, proximal LED lesion is uh, significant, even though stent is patent. RC, uh, circumflex is also significant. Lesions can receive a graft, PDA, good graftable vessels. So we gave him the option of a CABG, but he was not keen for CABG. He didn't underwent revascularization at that time because uh, all those calcified vessels, he was, he was a candidate for CABG, but he continued on medical follow up with the effort angina class two symptoms progressing in between. And uh, on medications, he never had an ACS. Then recently he visited with worsening angina class three effort angina. That time again, we offered him, okay, we'll have further angiogram and decide on revascularization. Within two, three days after visiting the OPD, he came to emergency room with a chest pain, uh, MST elevation. I had a ventricular tachycardia that time required DC version. And then he was brought back to the lab and had an angiogram. Angiogram is showing the same picture as in 2003, the RCA is occluded. And this is the left system. Significant calcification of the vessels. The mostly LED lesion has really progressed. And the stents remaining per uh, patent, the circumflex proximally has around a 50 to 60, 60 to 70% lesion. And if you can notice the distal LED, which was a very, very good, uh, this is the, this is just to take to show the calcification of the LED. And the distal LED compared, compared to 2013, which was a decent vessel, but now it is really extensively calcified and the significant snotic lesions in the distal LED also. So right from proximal mid up to the distal segments, LED has long second calcification and he's 85 with an episode of NST valuation MI and VT. With the restricted his scheme, so with the restricted finances, uh, finances and hardware. So this time there's no question. He quite he's no no for CABG. Then what to do? Proceed further. 
So my thought process was that he had a ventricular tachycardia with chest pain. So at least LAD can be fixed. So it was decided that we'll offer him to PTCA to LAD. The initial thought was there are too, too many bend points. So shall we tackle only the proximal segments, 81 year old, we'll leave the rest distally. Uh, distal lesions for medical follow up. Or what is the point in doing that with so many tight lesions in the distal LCX? These were all the mind, uh, in the mind while taking him for procedure. So, so this is how we proceeded. Uh, it, it was difficult to wire. It was the wire, uh, this wiring took at least 20 minutes. Uh, difficult to wire. The distal LED lesion still not crossed. And uh, tried to dilate that image lesion. Uh, balloon gave away, balloon ruptured, and you can see that the uh, diagonal is uh, going. Then another support wire was tried to advance and lesions were given a little more room so that we could manipulate the wire and go, go distally. Finally, this was a Corsair was uh, taken with this, uh, we, we could get the wire go, uh, we could get the cross that distal LED had a tight lesion that was closed with this and then we could take the wire distally and then this was exchanged with the uh, rota wire and finally a 1.5 rot rota burn could be advanced both the proximal and the distal lesions were given a rota run so even the proximal and then the distal lesions both both could be taken a rota run and so then uh, uh, two o balloons were taken two o balloons were uh, tracked uh, and uh, C really it was dilated from uh, distal to mid and uh, proximal LED. This was a series of uh, small balloons, all are 2 and 2.5 balloons were taken to serially dilate the lesions. So finally, this is how, where we have reached. So we were al allowed the two stents to be used, and one uh, this thing was what we got a. Uh, IVL balloon was uh, allowed as per the scheme. So we dilated the proximal lesions and then by that time the bigger balloons were not tracking so we have to use a guidecilla to track the devices. So the proximal lesions were dilated and then we took a 3.5 into 10 uh, IVL and they given uh, some Eight shocks were given. Then we tested while taking a bigger balloon whether it is tracking and dilating the dilating the lesions. This was well tracked and dilated. And finally, they distally started stenting the LED with the 2.75 into 40. And approximately with a 3.5 into 40 with the overlap. This was a proximal stender. And finally, the proximal lesions were dilated with the 4 into 10 balloons. And that overlap portion was again dilated with the 3.5 into 8 balloon. So these are the two, two images uh, to start with uh, what we had and uh, to finish with uh, what we could achieve. The LA portal views, the, LA, LA, uh, the RA portal views, the lesions to free. In the cranial views, views you can find that the osteoprox, osteoprox LED was a little under dilated. Had the finances been uh, allowed, uh, it would have been an excellent case for us uh, to take an opium balloon initially and dilated that osteo segment. Otherwise, in the portal views, that uh, looks uh, that looked really, really opened up. So we thought that we have done a reasonably good job by getting a good flow in the LED. Distally, it was a diffusely diseased vessel. Uh, now we can clearly see that the distal LED is flowing well. This is collateralizing RCA, so we feel that we have done a, within, the, within the things we have given a reasonable good flow to the LF system, which is a viable LED territory. Uh, had the finances allowed, I would have uh, really loved to approximate to dilate uh, even before taking that osteoproximal LED would have gone a little more. Uh, but then the caudal views were uh, 
little reassuring. So left it at now. It is almost six weeks. He has come for review. He is uh, doing well. So, Mahesh, I am uh, through my slides. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. That is a fabulous case that you presented. Ajay Swami, you, your comments on the case followed by the opinion from the chairpersons. Ajay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Mahesh. Thanks very much. Actually, I was multitasking and you know lost in the beauty of the case. I think it was extremely difficult. And um, whenever one has uh, tortuosity plus calcium, it's always uh, a double whammy, always difficult. And one has to use multiple techniques to get in get out of trouble. Um, I was wondering, um, suppose you did have imaging, in what way would you have changed your strategy? Uh, Dr. Naveen, could you uh, just elaborate? Suppose you did have imaging, access to imaging. Uh, I don't think I would have done uh, anything different with this. Uh, I was not much concerned other than show, showing it for a presentation, but uh, I, I would really <laughs> love to have a copy balloon for this case. Imaging, yes, I know. I am I am imagining that uh, all the way it is a circumferential calcium in multiple areas. Uh, because in multiple views, you can see everywhere it is parallel light. So I am imagining that it is a circumferential calcium. 272 uh, degrees arc will be there in most of the places. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there, there's uh, maybe a little bit more to it. Could you have changed your bar size or your um, rotational speed uh, or something? There were also two options. 1.75 was there, 1.5 was there. But then that bend, I was a little worried whether it will get trapped or something. So after many thought only, I zeroed it on to 1.5. Whether should we take it 1.5? Yes, I have gone with some balloons, but uh, I have shown only one balloon rupturing. At least two, three balloons have ruptured in the way whether it will get trapped and all. So after a lot of thinking, discussion, okay, then 1.5 will take. So I think option, it's a... Option was only for a one rotor, one rotor, one, one, one bar only we could take. So we right, take right. So, you know, whatever you have done is absolutely fine. I'm just trying to learn from your case. What we would probably have done was after the first rotor, we would probably have imaged and then decided whether to upsize the burr or not. And obviously, OPN would have been a fantastic tool. I felt that the bends were not so bad that we could needed to get worried about rota. The larger burr size you use, the lesser the risk of entrapment anyway. It's the smaller burrs that create problem as far as entrapment is concerned. But I think great case, lovely learning points. And you know whatever the operator does at that particular point is fine. I just want to learn for and tell you what we would be doing in our lab. Wonderful case. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just go on to the next case. And after that, there is a question for the expert panel that the question asked is, uh, there is rotna regret. There is uh, ideal regret as said by uh, Dr. Praveen Chandra. Do you have, a, uh, do you have also an OPN regret? Any experience? That's a question to be answered by the expert panel after this presentation by uh, Dr. Rama Kumari, who is a unit head of cardiology in NIMS uh, Hyderabad. Dr. Rama, you're all yours. Sir, uh, good evening, uh, teachers and uh, colleagues. Am I audible, sir? You're audible. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, I have a lot of experience uh, because we are working in a teaching institution. And uh, uh, please, uh, Vinod, can you share my videos? Vinod, please. Uh, Ma'am, ma your screen is already shared. You you can use it uh, the way you want. I, I believe the presentation is visible, visible Dr. Mahesh? Yes, yes. yes so, great. So, ma'am, you can control it at your end. Uh, you can present control. the case uh, like normally, Rama. It will be visible. Go to the next slide from your side only. Uh, sir, uh, we are working in a big teaching and uh, training in institution. And uh, because of uh, my residents and uh, uh, assistant professors are there. Uh, my, uh, we did uh, one uh, case. It is a simple case, but it, we made a, a complex case. Uh, oh. How we man uh, manage it after this case? Just I want to just give this. Mm -hmm. Next slide. I'm not able to go to you know, next slide. Next slide, I'm gonna... Yes, oh, okay, ma'am, I'll do it, yeah. Please play it. Uh, 
this is a very simple case. Sir. This man, a 58 year old male patient, he presented with unstable angina and uh, two day ago good LV function. And uh, we did angiogram showing uh, uh, single vessel disease that is uh, middle lady and FFR done, it is a significant. So, and uh, we did uh, PFTCA to middle lady. And uh, we did PTCA, it is a went on well. And uh, it is at around 6 uh, p.m. after uh, uh, after 10 PTCAs, we did, took long because it is a simple case. Before, after PTCA, what we noticed, uh, there is a small uh, perforation after taking the angio. So, so uh, this, we used a uh, ginger medium for this case because the torture is still and, uh, and there is a small, uh, can you please uh, repeat that the previous uh, video, previous, previous one. And uh, we noticed a small uh, pericardial effusion of, uh, of this uh, patient. So we had, uh, can you go back, uh, can you go back please? Can you go back? Can you show the previous, previous slide? Previous slide. Previous slide. Previous slide. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yes. yeah B, yeah, yes. There, there was a, a procedure went on well, and uh, next uh, we have noticed a small perforation. Next, go, and go to next slide. Yeah, plate. Small perforation was there. So we don't want to, uh, shall we, I want to ask this uh, panel, Shall we leave this for observation or I uh, want to keep some uh, this uh, uh, balloon uh, to this one? What is the uh, expert one uh, panel opinion regarding this uh, small perforation? Can, can you play it again? I mean, we want yes. to know where the perforation is going. I thought it was filling the ventricle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The septal, sir. It is a septal. Yes, septal going into the ventricle. But uh, small pericard per per pericardial effusion was also noticed, sir, with echo. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is your opinion regarding this, sir? A panel, expert panel opinion. Sh can I leave for uh, observation or uh, can I go for, uh, for this uh, preparation portion at this stage? It's going to the pericardium, you have to close it. Yeah, next, go to next slide. Go to next slide, please. So what uh, we had, uh, immediately we noticed that uh, there is small uh, pericardial effusion and but the patient was hemodynamically stable and uh, we took uh, 2.5 to 18 uh, mm graft master and uh, deployed under nominal pressure. It was a distant, so we don't want to go under high pressures and uh, so perforation was uh, uh, very well uh, managed. And we kept an uh, patient was uh, discharged with the DAPT and uh, we observed uh, for two days. He was hemodynamically stable and there was no pericardial effusion and uh, we discharged him with the DAPT score. Next, uh, what happened? And uh, at, uh, next, next slide. And uh, what is this? Uh, uh, this uh, uh, 15, six weeks after this, uh, what happened? He presented with acute anterior MI. We was wonder. I was wondered, and I asked, insisted him, and are you continuing DAPT or not? He said, I have not stopped any DAPT score, and I have not stopped. And what you have prescribed? He showed me all the tablets also. So, and uh, he has we did uh, easy showing frank uh, anterior MI and with the moderate LV dysfunction and with the normal sinus rhythm, patient was hemodynamically stable. So we took him to the cath lab and uh, we did angiogram. This is the angiogram picture and uh, this one is uh, uh, graft master was uh, totally occluded and there was a, a thrombus before to the, uh, in between the stunt, previous stunt and the graft master, it was occluded. Uh, that Next, next, next slide, please. 
next slide next slide please go to next slide and uh, in this uh, so uh, so we want uh, i thought that uh, previous uh, we have not uh, uh, graft master was not uh, adequately uh, disinflated so what we did i took 2.5 into 10 open nc balloon for this graft master and to open this i did uh, actually uh, this uh, OCT run also for this to know the to study the, uh, the pathology insight and uh, unfortunately because of this covid uh, duties i don't have all these uh, uh, the technicians are not available so i have not done taken the OCT uh, this uh, run pre and post run OCT for this it was nicely demonstrated that uh, graft master was totally occluded and uh, between, in between previous stunt and graft master there was a thrombotic occlusion of a stage and uh, so at this stage at this point we kept another uh, uh, stunt next go to next must be slide b play the slide b yeah we uh, kept another uh, Yes. Another stunt in between. And uh, we grab, this is the OCT run pullback for this graft master study. Uh, what happened to the uh, this etiology and what is the extent of the length of the thrombus? And the next, next, next slide. And this was the OCT run of the Craft master, and this is see the craft master, and what is occluded. This was occluded, total occluded, and this after this there was a thrombus, and after that, and the previous stent was nicely well opposed, and uh, nothing was there. So in between there was thrombus and craft master occluded. So because with open NC two point five into ten, opened very well and deployed uh, at twenty five atmospheres with uh, I kept it for one minute and uh, it was opened very well and post OCT run after this next go to next uh, slide please uh, Vinod. Next slide. Open and say already I have all everybody discussed I don't want to discuss and I kept one more uh, stunt in between this graft master and the previous stunt and uh, opposed very well and the same open and see I uh, used for this uh, again at the junction of uh, previous uh, the newly deployed stunt and uh, uh, previous graft master and the final OCT run. And I could not have that OCT run because uh, this uh, pandemic era technician was not available. This was the ang final angiographic uh, film, and this patient is doing well. And I advised him for a dual antiplatelet therapy for 36 to 48 months. And now he is coming for regularly for follow-up and he is doing well. This is my case. And after that, we have so many cases and uh, this uh, COVID-19 duties, I uh, have not collected all these uh, uh, complex cases. Thank you for your kind um, hearing and uh, I invite all the criticists of this uh, my procedure. Thank you, Dr. Amma. Just very the most honest case presented today, Dr. Hiramat, and your comments, and then we'll go on to the next case. We are running short of time. Yeah, I was actually um, uh, not very cons uh, sure whether you needed to seal the perforation. I think the perforation was probably through the septal. And it was probably communicating with the ventricle, and. Uh, uh, there was a gap also. Okay, I mean, the perforation obviously the happened during so the first procedure. Yeah, somebody is clear now. And uh, the uh, presentation one week later showing that uh, perforation, uh, that itself says that uh, it could have been left alone. Yes, I, I, would, I, I would probably leave it alone. Uh, it was communicating with probably one of the ventricles, most likely the left ventricle. And so many times you can leave them alone and not do anything at all. So my decision, once you saw the septal branch going to the LV, 
was probably don't do anything, just leave him alone. But uh, the thing is, uh, he is uh, developing pericardial effusion, sir. That is a worrying thing. That's why we kept uh, that uh, craft master in this case. So you are not sure whether it's only with the ventricle or whether it was yeah, communicating yeah. with the ventricle as well as the pericard. Pericard, I'm not sure, sir. That's why we kept immediately craft master, sir, in this case. Can I make one comment, just a short comment? Just please. one yes, second. Please, please. Uh, so what I what we have done is that um, we have a series of about thirty cases which we are which we submitted and waiting for uh, acceptance um, in the cardiology journal. And what we did was to just bury the covered stent. I think the problem with the covered stent is that they really they try they tend to collapse and you have under expansion because they just don't have radial force. So what we do is we take a thin strut stent and just over stent it. And with this, you seal the edges so you don't have an endoleak, which you frequently have, and you have no stent thrombosis. So in these cases which we submitted, we have no stent thrombosis because what you, what you had, it happens a lot. Covered stents tend to thrombose uh, not very rarely, especially if they are not big uh, and in proximal vessels. No, Dr. Florin, can you say it again? I mean, you, you're putting in a covered stain and you put another stain through that? Yeah. And it, so the stains will protrude on either side of the covered stain. Exactly. Say, you know, how many? About five millimeters? I think we have, so usually 18, we would cover with 23 millimeters. You don't need a lot. You just need to cover the edges. So the, so the edge of the covered stain is really tacked to the wall. Because very often, if you have a big perforation with a covered stent, you no, will not be able to, to seal the perforation completely. You'll have to do inflations for a long time. And with this, you, you cover it immediately. Because, you know, then I would take it maybe even a bit longer. Just, just tuck it to the wall, expand it nicely, and then you are done. And this, this kind of uh, uh, using covered stents then becomes attractive even, you know, for fistulas or things like that. Uh, otherwise, it's quite uh, to put uh, to cover uh, to use a covered stent for a fistula when you have such a high risk of thrombosis is not not worth it. But sure. I, uh, we are really short of time, sir. We have to move on, and then otherwise, the two people may not be able to present the cases. So we right. have Dr. Nagesh Wagmare coming in with challenges posted by a complex calcified PCI lesions. Uh, Dr. Wagmare, your this stage is yours. You got exactly. Good evening, okay. sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for this opportunity to present my case. <clears throat> so I'm uh, presenting my case of uh, uh, complex calcified lesion in the LAD. Okay. So a 53 years old gentleman who is a known hypertensive diabetic and hypothyroid on medical management regularly presented to us with two days history of rest angina re repeated episodes and it was associated with sweating. Uh, during the second COVID wave, everybody patient was, uh, all patients were uh, subjected to COVID test and he found to have COVID positive. So admitted to the COVID wing of the hospital. ECG showed infra LMI, echo showed RWMA with uh, mild LV dysfunction. Uh, ejection fraction was somewhere around 45%. The patient was late for lysis and so treated with uh, medical therapy standard of uh, line, including DAPT, low molecular heparin, ARB for his hypertension, beta blocker, insulin uh, to control the sugar and uh, he was also treated for the uh, as per the covid protocol his cardiac enzymes were uh, elevated but other uh, blood parameters were normal d dimer was 256 it was not too high for the patient the ct score was 9 though patient's covid was positive he remained asymptomatic for any of the covid uh, symptoms or signs on day four and five, we did RT-PCR uh, twice, which uh, turned out to be negative, so shifted to non-COVID wing. Uh, then uh, patient was subjected to angiography. He remained, remained asymptomatic for the COVID. This was his uh, angiographic uh, shoots. Uh, it was a left dominant circulation. RCA was totally occluded, but it was very small and non-dominant. Uh, LED, we can see it was heavily calcified, long segment uh, lesion, starting from the proximal segment, extending up to the mid, uh, uh, segment of the LED. Circumflex was uh, normal, it was dominant, and OM had lesion, the diagonals had lesions. This was the LAO cranial view, and this was the RCA shoot of this patient. 
so uh, my uh, thinking and plan was clear the patient was advised to undergo cabg since the patient was uh, becoming stable i could uh, uh, the patient could have been waited so immediate cabg was anyways not available in view of recent covid uh, status the surgeons was not willing to touch this patient during the hospital stay our plan was to bring back the patient after 15 days for the cabg the patient was being monitored in hospital and on day 7 he noticed recurrence of anginal chest pain the troponins were rising uh, as compared to the uh, initial levels so decided to proceed with pci in this patient so the issues were it was a multivessel disease now behaving like unstable angina uh, nor uh, rather semi followed by uh, enstemi which there was extensive calcification in the lad so i prepared my checklist it was urgent uh, situation but i was not in hurry to uh, 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 not do my preparation so i made my checklist made sure everything is there uh, i decided to go for femoral access imaging oct was available i had all the nc balloons ot and nc in uh, my lab cutting balloons were also prepared rotablation was planned with 1.25 and 1.5 mm burr uh, standby ivl was not available for me at that point of time Uh, and there was anesthesia backup and all team members were there i work in a teaching institute so that i have a uh, uh, that facility so i quickly did the pci to the om with two days poba of d1 d2 with good result and then i proceeded with the pci of the led in the second shoot we can see i tried to do the oct uh, pre preparation uh, of led lesion but uh, the oct catheter failed to cross the critical uh, calcified led lesions so i had no choice but to take the uh, switch to rota i took 1.25 mm burr but with multiple attempts also i could not uh, crack the mid led lesion uh, we can see there is a uh, dense calcification and my rota burr failed to cross after a certain point there were two obstructions first was cleared uh, so i planned to upsize the burr to 1.5 mm there was a, a technical problem occurred at that Uh, time and uh, uh, the roto console was not working i could not do the rota with 1.5 mm burr so i left with the options of balloon only so i initially took opnc and flexstone but the balloons failed to cross fortunately uh, one of the conventional nc 2.75 by 15 mm uh, i used uh, since the cutting balloon was not going to the uh, point of maximum calcification uh, uh, once this 2.75 mm nc balloon was there i dilated it we can see this uh, strain boost there was huge calcification and uh, in the second image there was a vest uh, nap because of the nap napkin ring calcification at the led lesion i could uh, dilate it uh, with high pressure nc balloon uh, there was dissection at this stage the patient complained of chest pain there was uh, perspiration noticed so i quickly went ahead and did the uh, Uh, deployment of a stent 2.75 by 40 mm uh, uh, latest generation regulating stent in the mid led and after uh, correct uh, treating that dissection part i went ahead and did the uh, oct run which indeed showed lot of uh, segments with under expansion and uh, i required post dilatation with the nc and open nc balloons so this was my uh, oct run after the first stent which was deployed in the mid led we can see there was no distal edge dissection this part of the stent uh, was uh, expanded well but where the napkin ring calcification was there it was still under expanded the expansion was 67% and the msa was uh, low uh, than uh, what is acceptable and in the proximal segment of the led there was another uh, segment of uh, heavy calcification it was almost like 360 degree calcification as we can see in this image so at this stage i had to prepare this lesion before i could take the second stent i used cutting balloon uh, 3 mm i gradually increased the pressure i kept it for longer duration and uh, prepared the lesion uh, in this image we can see there is a, a huge calcification especially in the media and it is all around the uh, vessel segment vessel wall after that i took another regulating stent uh, in the proximal led in uh, uh, overlapping fashion with the second stent in the mid led it was 3.5 by 22 mm and uh, i did oct check after this and uh, did the post dilatation also uh, now we can see the stent is expanded in the mid segment as well as uh, the distal segment this was my final angiogram 
uh, in the aleo cranial view when the where the bend is in the middle led after the diagonal i can see some portion of under expansion but uh, oct uh, imaging gave me uh, confidence there was 88% expansion in the mid led segment the proximal led was 94% uh, expansion achieved with msa acceptable in both the segments so my take home message is if we are contemplating pc of calcified lesions we should be well prepared we should know the uh, uh, working of all the hardware that will be needed to treat a uh, calcified lesion we should be well versed well experienced in that we should have a complete checklist Uh, which should be uh, prepared and the hardware should be kept ready when we are dealing with uh, such kind of calcified lesions ivl availability is an issue at present in addition to the cost of ivl and uh, we should uh, spare ample time uh, uh, spend uh, spend ample time analyzing the angiogram and should be able to devise our plan a plan b we should be able to anticipate difficulties and be ready with alternative plans imaging is optimal it identifies the issues but Uh, many a times we may not be able to address all the issues uh, seen in the oct so we should be satisfied at a good result we should not uh, try and achieve perfect each and every time if it is uh, going to be high risk for the patient thank you sir thank you dr nagesh a uh, very good case uh, i will request dr raja nag to start sharing his screen in the meantime dr pravin chandra your comments on this case please yeah so i must again say that one thing which i must uh, appreciate from dr nagesh's presentation is in the last slide what he wrote and what he also said in the beginning is the checklist so in a patient like this it can never be uh, it's not a good idea to do a ad hoc angioplasty you have to make a plan and once you have a plan you must make sure that you you have adequate hardware available in the cath lab and the checklist should be ticked off if the checklist is complete then there is hardly any chance to falter so i must say that i must congratulate him for this uh, very fine demonstration of a very difficult case and uh, demonstrating that in a complex situation we must have everything available although he did not have ivl but he knew that he will be able to handle it with different ways so i must say that uh, having a open nc on the shelf is actually Uh, kind of obviates the need of many many things including sometimes even rotablation because i have used now many times 1.5 nc open nc uh, which is actually a balloon which can go into very tight lesions where we would earlier used to use rota and then do a open nc yeah, 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 yeah. or a ivl so we do it with the 1.5 balloon make a path and then take a bigger balloon inside and You know, dilate these lesions. So very well done, and uh, very nice. Uh, uh, I mean, why here. should we have this as a checklist? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I in fact tell my cath lab uh, chief uh, that she has to report to me if something is missing. I mean, I assume that everything is available to me, and somebody has to report to me if uh, before starting a case something is not available. So I think that checklist is. probably i mean if of course it depends on how busy is your lab but uh, the checklist should be for the uh, chief of the nursing that if she doesn't have a particular thing she should report to you that something is not available i would probably walk off the cath lab you know if something is not available mm -hmm. on a given particular day thank you sir i agree with you dr hiramat very much agreeable but for a particular case making a checklist is you know making your plan that this is my plan a plan b and these are the equipments which i need sometimes you know and when the labs are busy sometimes a 1.5 nc is not there sometimes you know a, a particular you know rota bar is not available because you know so many cases are being done every day so that is why i say that making a checklist for yourself for the you know for the entire team which is going to work in the cath lab and for the technicians to know that everything should be available so Thank that you, you know there is no yeah, gap because once the patient is on table then you cannot say that oh i'm going to walk off from the cath lab you know dr uh, raja nag is the intervention cardiologist or senior intervention <laughs> thank you for the follow lenings please start your presentation thank you yeah uh, thank you good evening everyone so uh, i'll show you a case of instant restenosis in a patient who 
underwent uh, repeated uh, intervention. So this is a 70 year old man, non smoker, hypertensive, non diabetic, and he was suffering from angina since last three months on maximum medications. Now, to go back to his history, he underwent uh, bypass surgery with three grafts in two, uh, 1999 with Lima to LAD and venous grafts to OM and diagonal. Uh, in 2011, his story started uh, with revascularizations. Uh, he underwent PTC and stenting of his venous grafts, which was occluded to the diagonal. Again, in 2015, he underwent uh, PCI and stenting of his native RCA. Uh, he was doing well again till 2018 when he had presented with angina again and uh, underwent a stenting of his venous graft to OA. In 2019, in the early part of the pandemic in February month, he presented to me with uh, all this uh, uh, revascularization and procedures were done in the same hospital in our hospital in Apollo Glenicals and he has been a very compliant patient. So in 2019, he again presented with acute LVF in the emergency with the ejection fraction of 30%. Uh, we treated him with the maximum uh, medications and he stabilized and was discharged home. In 2021, again, he presented to me with severe teeth and jaw pain on exertion. So ECG this time uh, shows uh, atrial fibrillation with controlled ventricular rate. ECO showed an ejection fraction of 45% with a serum creatinine of 1.4. Uh, he is currently on medications like torsimide, epidemon, bimata, carbidolol, and antiplatelets. So this was the angiogram done. These are his native vessels which were occluded like we know already. And this was his RCA which was stented in 2018. So we can see a uh, tight instant restenosis uh, with evidence of calcium even in the angiographic images. So these are his venous grafts, which were patent with uh, moderate diseases. So I decided to leave them alone. His lima was patent. I don't know if you can appreciate these images on small laptops. So my next plan was to uh, do the uh, PCI of his instant restenosis of his uh, native RCA with some image guided uh, technique. So I decided to do a OCT guided PCI of his instant restenosis and go by the femoral route and wait for another 24 hours because his uh, the, uh, renal function was on the borderline and we put him on IV saline and uh, some uh, uh, NAC. So next day we took him up for uh, PTC of his native ISR with a six French JR and a C on blue wire and I went ahead with two wires from the very beginning because I knew I would have issues with the guide support. Wiring was not difficult. So initially I dilated, P dilated with a small balloon to allow my OCT catheter to, to pass through. I P dilated with a 2.5 and 12 NC and then took a OCT run. So this is the OCT run. So uh, to uh, comment on this, uh, I would say that uh, his uh, uh, previous stent was well deployed and was uh, well expanded by the uh, interventionist who did his uh, native vessel angioplasty way back uh, in uh, 2018. So what he presented to me uh, is like severe new intimal hyperplasia with uh, mixed morphology of calcific and fibrotic plaque. So this is uh, the pathology which uh, we know from uh, Mehran images. So these are the types of instant restenosis we come across. And these are some still images. Uh, we follow the MLD max algorithm. So MLD is like the pre-stenting. We take uh, proximal distal reference diameter, the length and the morphology. The morphology which was evident was showing calcium but it was not more than 270 degrees. So we did not think of uh, doing any rota ablation or a uh, lithotripsy. So we decided to go ahead with the angioscult or a scoring value. So we did the angioscult with a 3 into 10 millimeter. P dilated in the maximum uh, narrowest diameter. But as you can see from the angiographic images, uh, there was still some amount of waste in this part, which was not giving way. So I dilated several times. This was the portion which was the tightest. Sorry, 
I missed one slide. So this was uh, when we decided uh, this cutting balloon is not helping me further. So we'll go ahead and do a OPN with high pressure uh, going up to 45 atmospheres. So after the second inflation on the next orthogonal view, we could see that the waste is given no. and we were happy to do the OCT run now. Hmm. I did the OCT run and we showed uh, good luminal gain with cracks in the calcium. So uh, having achieved this, uh, we decided to go ahead and do the stenting. So there were areas of dissection and cracks in the calcium. There were micro dissections also, which I had some still images which I couldn't upload for paucity of time. So this is a 3D rendering of the same uh, post OPN and post uh, uh, scoring balloon thing. And I intentionally kept two wires, uh, knowing that this would further help me in scoring the lesion. So we did some more P dilatations. Then we stented it with a uh, four into 28 millimeter DES. Sorry, it was a 3.5 into uh, 28. It was not four. I remember correctly because the earliest stent was uh, three millimeter in diameter. We have those records. So then uh, it was dilated and this was the final NGO one. This is a 3D rendering image of the final angiogram. And uh, the stent was expanded more than 100%. Uh, uh, ADA achieved was more than seven. So we are satisfied at that. And uh, the overlap part was also well expanded. So this is the overlap part we are coming to. And we left it at that. So mechanisms of uh, drag eluting stent has been the ecclesia. Let us stop here. We'll, we'll skip the, dis the discussion part for the time being because we are running short of time. Uh, sure. the, the fabulous case. I'll, I'll just go on to the next person because otherwise he won't get an opportunity to present. No problem. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for the year. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Manan Anand, can you please share your slides? Uh, he is uh, the director of cardiology at the Amritsar Heart Institute. Dr. Anand, if you're there. I saw him five minutes back. Sir, uh, just disconnected, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah, sir has joined. Sir has joined. Yeah. Dr. Manan, your turn to go on. Please uh, project your, uh, your comment screen share and start the presentation, please. And after this presentation, I'd request the opinion of the uh, chairpersons on the uh, on their comments on this uh, BIC conference, best intervention cases conference, before we conclude the session. Dr. Anand, if you are there, please share your screen. Yeah, please share your screen. Evening, everyone. Uh, today I would like to present you this case. Uh, this is a, basically an ultra high pressure plaque modification device in undilatable region. My case is like uh, it's a 75 year old male presented with acute coronary syndrome, acute MI with LV dysfunction. 
He was in cardiogenic shock and patient was taken for angiogram, which showed proximal LED 100% occlusion. I did thrombosuction and removed certain amount of thrombus burden to restore the coronary blood flow. It was pre-dilated with two 2.5 balloons and following it, I stented the lesion with 3.5 into 40 DES. After that, I could see that the stent wasn't deployed and consecutive, I did the Again, post dilatations with 3.56, 3.510 balloon, but stent could not be extended and the patient became unstable. Then I uh, did a dilatation with the 3.510 OPNC balloon at a 37 atmosphere, which opened the stent, leading to proper acquisition of DES. So these are the, basically the still images showing the dog boning of the stent here with a post dilatation NC balloon. And after that, this is opening of the stent with the PNC 3.5 into 10. These are the angiographic images. Sorry, this is the angiographic image. This is basically 100% LED occlusion, wiring of LED. Can you go on the presentation mode? It'll be easier for you. This is the epicranial view. Please go on the presentation mode. It will be easier for you. Presentation mode. We are presentation mode. We are going to go to the This is the uh, deployation of the stent, showing non-deployed stent at the proximal part of the LED. This is the dilatation uh, with the OPNC balloon, subsequent dilatation, still the stent is not opening up proximally. This is the dilatation with the OPNC at 37 atmosphere. After this, uh, when the stent was open, we restored the TB3 flow in the LED and the patient became stable. And uh, this is my case, which is a very short case. I had taken a very small uh, amount of uh, images as the patient had acute MI and was having ST elevation. And uh, this is my uh, experience with OPNC, that it was a very uh, undilatable stent, which just opened because of the OPNC balloon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anand. I'm happy that we could squeeze you in the last minute cutting short a few others. So, Hiramat sir and Dr. Uh, Praveen Chandra, your concluding remarks on uh, the cases presented and uh, the conference that is the best interventional cases conference in general, so that we can conclude. I mean, we are basically here to discuss the opn and C. Uh, and personally, I feel the pre dilatation use of opn and C is the one which is very desirable. I think if you're able to crack whatever calcium is there or whatever heart fibrotic lesions are there. Uh, I think you have made very good progress and then the stents come in and then with a conventional non-compliant balloon, you are able to achieve a very good stent expansion. So I would probably think that uh, OPNNC is more for pre-dilatation compared to post-dilatation. You also heard discussion that 50% of the time it is for pre dilatation, 50% of the time it is for post dilatation. Yes, I think post dilatation also can, I mean, post stent deployment dilatation also can be done uh, with uh, uh, OPNNC. Uh, but my emphasis is more on uh, 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 pre dilatation. Uh, if you fail on that, I think you have more options available to you uh, and uh, you, they should be used before the stent goes in. That's how I would look at uh, 
uh, using an OPNNC. Provind, your comments, I think. Yeah, I'm, uh, I missed that uh, this, uh, last point. Uh, basically, you know, I also agree that, you know, we have to uh, pre dilate the lesion as much as possible and then only use uh, open NC when it is an indilatable lesion where the lesion is not yielding. That is when I typically go ahead and uh, use an open NC balloon for very, very high pressures. The combination, Torin, what do you think? I mean, you do a rota, uh, the vessel is say uh, three plus, uh, and then you use uh, open NC. Uh, I think this combination works very well because rota uh, will uh, have a very good effect on the calcium, which is uh, uh, along the lumen. And while open NC will work on the entire uh, depth of the wall. Uh, so would you prefer uh, rota with an open NC or would you prefer rota with an IVL balloon? I think, you know, I will certainly, you know, as you said, rota with open NC is reasonable, good choice. If it works, why not? So I will say that uh, after doing a rota, and if you are able to dilate this lesion with the balloon, especially open NC balloon, I think the job is done. Why necessarily spend that kind of money or use that technology where it is really not? Uh, no, because uh, rota is going to work only on the calcium, which is... Uh, very close to the lumen. Yeah. yeah. While IVL is going to work on the deeper calcium also. Absolutely. That's the reason Absolutely. why I'm trying to differentiate. Yeah. But the, if the lesion gives way, I mean, basically at the end of the day, if the lesion gives way very well with the, you know, this combination, fair enough. Otherwise, sometimes we have to go ahead with the IVL also. Even after doing a rota and a balloon dilatation, if it is not yielding, we'll go with the IVL balloon in that case. However, okay. in many cases where we are not doing rota, just you know taking a pre-dilatation balloon and then doing a IVL if the you know the calcium is like a complete ring calcification, one can go ahead with a IVL also straight away. And if the patient can afford it, and of course uh, if the anatomy is conducive, why not? Thank you, sir. I think we are bang six o'clock uh, for the uh, transluminar team to conclude, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for joining and, and uh, 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 explaining all the, all the different facets of uh, the, this session of ultra uh, ultra high pressure using OpenNC. I really appreciate your time and uh, thanks again for uh, adding value to this. Yeah. So be safe, be healthy, and thank you so much again, everyone, all the delegates who have logged in as well. So just to intimate, we have more than 700 live viewers. So really appreciate them for this patient hearing as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.